Hello, we're talking Tank Girl. That's right, we're talking Tank Girl, not the comic book. The movie. This is the limited edition set, courtesy of Umbrella Entertainment in um, the land of Oz, where this film is pretending to be set out. I don't know, it's a weird thing. Uh, yeah, this is the limited edition version limited 2,250 units, I believe, um, glossy cover, which is nice, I had no idea that that was Naomi Watts until, um, until I saw her name pop up in the credits, so I was like, oh my god, that's Naomi Watts? It's kind of crazy, especially because she's, like, smaller on the cover, I expected it to be, like, a young girl, like, a teenage sidekick or whatever, obviously you got all the stuff in there, the back cover, which wraps around, you got Malcolm McDowell, you've got some of the dancers, the, um, mutant, well, they're called Rippers in the film, but they're like mutant kind of uh, kangaroo people. Um, the decently iconic scene in the film, there's a lot of scenes in the film, to be simply put. You do have uh, your cover, which I think it's not focusing properly on. Um, but yeah, it just says Tank Girl, Umbrella Lobo, and MGM. I haven't done anatomy in my Blu-ray in a while, so it's like, what do I talk about in these videos? I'll do the unboxing, then I'll give you my film review, and then I'll give you my review on the video transfer and the audio, which I only listened to the 5.1, but still, and the uh, special features. So, packaging, review, and other reviews. Um, I haven't fully dived into the actual packaging itself, because I got it yesterday, watched the film, did all the special features and stuff, just kind of figured I would, because I could. So this is number, oh, 862 of 2,000, so it's 2,000 units, so yeah, as you can see, it's got all your specs, all your uh, extra little details of your posters and your booklets and all that stuff, uh, extra information, talking about special features and everything, uh, region B probably locked, um, 5.1 and 2.0 uh, DTS HD Master Audio English. Uh, it is a 2 to 35 to 1, 2.35 to 1. You get the audio commentary with uh, the director and actress Lori Petty. The Revolution will be ahead of its time, which is an interview with the director, interview with uh, Lori Petty. Uh, oh, interesting. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's interesting how they phrase it, because they all have uh, different names. So I thought they would have actually followed up with what the names of the actual other interviews are. But it just says that you've got an interview with Laurie Petty, interview of Doug Jones, interview of production designer Catherine Hardwick, who, yes, directed Twilight, and uh, Tank, in brackets, Girl Power Video Essay by Alexandra Helen Nicholas, and the archival featurette, which is a, you know, five-minute making of, and the theatrical trailer. So, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's dive into it. I'll note first off, we do have everyone's favourite art cards, uh, nothing on the back, but you do get images, you got Malcolm McDowell, you got the infamous Tank Girl, uh, you got Malcolm McDowell and the infamous Tank Girl, you get again the infamous Tank Girl on her tank, uh, with Naomi Watts in the background there, there's, there's Naomi Watts, it's a jet girl is her name, because she has a jet, it's a very, um, innocent picture, uh, that is a kangaroo man, and and a tank girl with her um, robot, uh, with her, sorry, rocket uh, bra, I'll put it, I'll say bra, just, just in case, just in case. And then there's another scene of them, where's, where's that at, that, that's towards the end of the film during the big breakout scene, and uh, yeah, then you, wow, that's a pretty fun picture of tank girl, prior to getting her tank right at the start of the film, and um, then you get another picture of two characters, again, you get tank girl there, I think that's Jet Girl. She has a scene where she does have uh, clear pants. It's a it's a very costume heavy film, and then we get back to the start. So I'll, I'll leave a uh, Tank Girl as the main picture there. You get a booklet which comes with the original poster, Tank plus Girl. Uh, it is a you know stretching out photo kind of deal as it is. Nothing too fancy, but still nice. Uh, firm book. I think it's like. 32, I'm going to guess around 32 pages, what does it say, 48-page uh, booklet with introduction by the director, Rachel Talele, Talele, uh, yeah, I think it's Talele, um, and new writing by Anton Battelle, John Harrison, and Jared Gahan. I believe Jared actually edited the video essay that uh, 
Alexander Helen Nicholas did, and it's some really fun editing transitions. So uh, it's pretty nice. So again, you get some pictures, some of them that are duplicated as the art cards, an introduction by a director, which talks about the film. It's, it's nice how it's all formatted. You get posters, you get images, you get crazy different formats of text. Again, basically all the lobby cards infamously are just reprinted into the book, which I think is a bit annoying. I can't criticize Umbrella per se, but you know, it depends on if you really like art cards. I don't personally, don't, I don't give a shit for art cards half the time, because again, look, that's just, it's just the art cards. Uh, then you get the interview of uh, the essay by Jared uh, Ga Gahan. I think Gahan, but I think it's pronounced Gahan. I believe I've met him as well, actually. Um, some of these, surprisingly, you might believe are actually Australians. Uh, I don't know if I've personally met him, but I've been to some of the like talks he's done for like um, at Cinemaniacs and Monster Fest and whatever. So, yeah, uh, this one. I've met John. This is John Harrison. I did an interview with John. If you haven't seen it, it's part of my that interview show. Um, but yeah, John Harrison did the. Uh, Little talk about, let's see, Lords and Ladies of the Wasteland, the post apocalypse as seen, uh, as seen in Cold in Cold War genre. Um, yeah, I love the landscape element, but the in a folded book like this, it's not really my favorite. I don't really like books that are bound like this. But again, each section has its own color palette, and yeah, so yeah, I mean, look as an overall. It's a nice book, it works well, it's a little bit too bound for like expressing the artwork per se, but um, it is what it is. Then you have the film itself, which comes with a sleeve. This is also what the basic standard edition comes with. Uh, I do like the whole, um, what am I thinking of? I, you know that guy who did the canned soup posters? That's what this kind of has the vibe of, which is nice. I don't know why he's not... You know when someone's face comes to mind, but not their actual name? Yeah, that guy. You know who he is. But uh, that's the kind of approach this artwork is going for. And I like it. It's, I dig it. None of this really appears in the film. She only like wears his hat and goggles in like the opening scene, which is kind of funny. But also, she wears so many clothes in this movie. There are so many costume changes. There's one whole scene which is just a costume change, where she goes from one costume to another, to another, to another, all within one take. It's a, it's a hell of a picture. Um, yeah, then you get your standard artwork, which is the theatrical poster, the reversible, which just comes with the M-rated logo, and there is, of course, a poster, double-sided, which I'll get out as well, but again, you get your disc, uh, and then it just re-emphasizes, like, special features and all the extra details about the film, and all that jazz. It's a pretty simple, standard kind of bundle. You get the poster, which is double-sided, you get both the theatrical as a was it a4 sheet which isn't too bad it's pretty fun and then you get a landscape of what the box set artwork is which uh, is pretty good as well i do like this artwork it's nothing too flashy but i do like its style yeah it works well for the case i think so boy okay that's that's the whole set which i think is a pretty good set i'm i don't always like to buy the limited editions from umbrella but they do commit to the bit they do have some great sets which i do appreciate this one's not their most extravagant it's pretty basic in terms of the booklet and the poster and the art cards and all that kind of stuff you get the same from arrow video and whatnot but i like it i like the colors i like how they really go over the top of like this is all the kind of crazy looks and stuff that the film has had in its like marketing and stuff we're just going to recapture that plus some new artwork i don't know is it new artwork? Custom artwork, Outer Ridge Slipcase by David Loopy Dave Dunstan. So it is new artwork, which is really nice. What can I say about the film? I gave it three stars out of five. I enjoyed it. It's one of those things of like, when you know a film is bad or like notoriously awful when you go into it, sometimes you can have a better perspective. I think the same goes for something like Super Mario Bros, you know, that 1992 film, which I've reappreciated after my second watch. I was like, actually, it's a pretty fun movie. Sure, it's not the best in terms of its source material or whatever, but watching it as it is, it's still a pretty fun film, and I even did get the Umbrella Limited Edition <laughs> Trust the Fungus set. Yeah, dedication's a hell of a word. But the film itself, for Tank Girl, I did like. It's it's one of those things where, yes, it's a very messy film. It's got some weird humour. It has some strange characters. They get the costuming is crazy. The production design is crazy. The music choices are really good. 
To be fair, the fundamentals of I like Laurie Petty in the role, I've kind of always liked her. I don't think she lands a lot of the jokes because of how she talks, but I mean, a lot of them are like 90s kind of humor. It's like, I don't appeal to it as much, despite being someone born in the 90s. I wasn't raised in the 90s, so it doesn't, it's a very uh, different contrast for me personally. It's like watching Austin Powers sometimes. It's like sometimes you just get the joke, sometimes you don't. But that one's a lot more for the masses kind of deal. It's very different to Tank Girl. Uh, but I do like the production design. I like the, you know, the look of the film, the style of it, the costuming. Naomi Watts is interesting. I don't think she's great at first. She seems a bit too shy for the role, but as she grows throughout the film, she kind of, almost like a character arc, you know, comes more to herself and is like a much more interesting character by the end of the film. So people, like they have that element. Malcolm McDowell's pretty fun as the villain. He becomes like a hologram robot by the end of it, which is really amusing. The general premise of it is just apocalypse, but also... You know, Tank Girl lives at a house, gets attacked by, you know, water and power is literally what they're called, the bad guys, because <laughs> it's their thing. They like water, they like power. I like how the film just, ah, that's the bad guys. That's what they call it. It's stupid, but we don't care. And it ends up becoming the main kind of story, which isn't really a main story, is her saving a girl from water and power, um, which is cool. You know, that works well enough. It keeps the whole story as a flow. But there's a lot of in-betweens. There's a lot of, we're going here, we're going there, we're going to go to this place, which is like an abandoned mall, which is now a whole, oh, we're going to have this 1930s dance number. Uh, there's, there's, there's meeting the kangaroo people. There's so many different sections to this movie. It is, there's getting the tank. There's, again, there's a lot of stuff in this movie. It's a lot for like 100 minutes. And honestly, I don't dislike it. I do enjoy it. It's, I think because it reminded me a lot of a series of unfortunate events, like that, the book that became the movie, because I grew up watching that movie, it's like that kind of thing of we're putting three books together as one whole movie, you know, the start will be telling you, you know, about the main character, or in this case, the three orphans, same as with Tank Girl, giving them what their life is in their kind of paradise, in not so much paradise kind of world, before something bad happens and they have to go to a new place, deal with a new villain, or basically the main villain, in this case Malcolm McDowell, or Count Olaf, whatever, and eventually they escape that, be, find friends and other people. With Tank Girl, it's more of they kind of find either a mini-boss, or like like a sub-villain, or some friends to hang out with like along the way. Here's a good person, here's a bad person, but they're going in between, you know? Same kind of for a series of unfortunate events. They get adopted by different parents, whatever. Some of them are a bit more evil, some of them are a bit good. But in the end, or, I mean, that one, Count Olaf is there for the whole kind of thing, in different disguises. Malcolm McDowell isn't, you know. He's kind of there in the background, but um, it doesn't really matter that much. And then again, by the end of it, they have to face off against the villain and hopefully win. That kind of jam, you know. So a lot of that, in terms of adaptation, in terms of storytelling, I understood. Watching the interviews and having them being like, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's very crazy in this narrative because it's like a comic book. I'm like, yeah, but... True, sure. I mean, whether it's like the original comic book, sure. Like, that makes sense for its narrative structure and style. But again, comics, just because they're comic and comedic or very zany and colourful, it doesn't mean that they're always, like, have no story or structure. Sometimes they still have story and structure. But nevertheless, I understand the element of it being more like adapting, like, several different issues into one whole thing. Like, one volume, but it's all these different sub-stories that become one main story. So I can get behind that. I think there was another film, like, uh, I know there's Shin Ultraman, which is that kind of thing. It's It basically feels like a two-hour version of a TV show. It just feels like, like, 20-minute episodes, six of them shoved into one film. That's what this kind of feels like. So I can understand that style doesn't work so much as a movie as it would have maybe a TV series, which definitely would not have, A, gotten the budget it did for this, <laughs> for the film, and B, would not have had the effect. Like, this would not have done well on 90s TV, I don't think. Maybe, but again, it would have been bloody expensive, so it probably wouldn't have worked. But yeah, so I enjoyed the film. I know that I'll probably like it more on rewatch, because again, it's that kind of thing of the first time you're watching it, it's jarring, to say the least. So I imagine on a second watch, I'd be like, 
I know what to expect now, maybe I can understand the jokes better, that kind of stuff, because you kind of get behind the characters more. But again, a lot of the jokes didn't land for me per se, because I'm also like, I don't know when this is a joke and when this isn't a joke. Like one of the reviews I read about it after the fact was saying how they're very weirded out by the fact that she's almost acting like a 10 year old girl who's been like overly sexualized. But I'm like, isn't this based on a European comic book? That's kind of like what they do, isn't it? Like, same as like, like manga does the same kind of thing where they will like over sexualize a character despite their age. So I was like, eh. But it is what it is. Like, you're in the apocalypse. What, you're going to act like a rational person? Are you kidding me? Have you seen Mad Max? Those people don't act rational. It's just, it's just hunger and lust and power. It's, it's crazy, you know? So it, it kind of works. Like, I dig it. Audio-wise, I listened to the 5.1, and it sounded good from the get-go. It starts off with a cover of a Devo song, which I was like, I like this already. I didn't have any issues with it. There was no, like, strange sounds or crackling or hissing the the you know it's it sounded good i could understand what they were saying i could hear the music i could hear the sound effects there was nothing too dramatic so yeah it was a good decent enough mix i had no issues with it i didn't check out the stereo mix but i was pretty happy with the 5.1 picture wise yeah for the most part it looked really nice i think there was only one scene near the end where it kind of there was a bit of dirt and specks and stuff just kind of randomly but the rest of the film looked clean it looked really nice so looked healthy so I was really happy with it and it cuts between like comic book stuff and animated sequences and live action stuff so even that blends really well um it yeah just in general looks really nice and I was really happy with it uh it probably could have done like maybe a remaster wouldn't exactly be the worst thing in the world but at the same time I'm happy enough with the version that you get special feature wise there is the audio commentary which I didn't get around to listening to I don't know if it's a new audio commentary or if it's a, like, one that came with maybe an original DVD or something, so I don't know about that one. But I did watch all the uh, interviews, which there is one with the director. They are actually all titled as well, but the um, sheet I have here doesn't actually, doesn't actually tell me the names. It just says, interv I mean, even, even this just says interview of Laurie Petty, interview of Doug Jones, interview of the production designer, and interview... Okay, there's a lot of weird stuff. The back of this doesn't actually tell you it has an interview of the director, but then this does have a... says that it has an interview of the director, but it actually tells you what the name of it is. So, um... Some weird... <laughs> so someone, someone fucked up in the graphic design department for this set. Like, even if you look at that, I don't know if you can tell. Uh, so, yeah, interview of the director... There should be a dot there before interview of Laurie Petty, as there is a dot there and a you know a dot over here and whatever. But there's nothing, nothing that divides the uh, director's name with the next word, which is interview. So, yeah, it's a bit 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 weird. Um, I I don't mind, but it's like, you know, like I'm not gonna be like I want to buy this set just for an interview of the director. It has one. Interview of the director is pretty fun. They're all like fifteen to twenty minute long interviews, which cover like people's experiences, the production, stuff like that. The one with the director is probably the most interesting, but I don't think any of them weren't. I was happy to watch it. It was informative. It was nicely produced. It wasn't too fancy, easy, simple. We'll just sit down, listen and talk for about 10, 20, 50, you know, 10, 20 minutes or whatever, talking about the movie. Um, and it's interesting, you know, having them talk about, like, what the film as a cult status and whatever, that kind of approach. It's interesting watching Rachel talk about this stuff because I've seen a lot of her TV work with, like, Doctor Who and stuff. So she's directed some of the best Doctor Who of, like, the past, like, 10 to 15 years. And yet she also did fucking Tank Girl and Freddy's Dead of all films. It's like, man, she did some weird bloody movies when she did movie films. So movie films when she directed movies. Um, but nevertheless, nice interview. The interview with uh, Laurie Petty was pretty fun as well. Um... Same goes for the interview of Doug Jones, which you think, Doug Jones is in this film? And yeah, he's one of the kangaroo people. I like how they show which one he is. He talks about the makeup and all that kind of stuff and having to get into how this film, like, because he was working with Stan Winston and even, like, Ice-T was there. There's a weird cast in this movie. And talking about how, like, because of doing this kind of costuming and whatever, it led him to do a job with Stan Winston's company, which led him to do this and that, and hence people know him because you know, of these characters and creatures he's done because he was so good at it the first time around. So it's an interesting, like, stepping stone film. Like, they're even talking about... 
it was either the director or Laurie, I, they both talked about Naomi Watts at different stages and how she was as an earlier actress and whatever compared to what she is now. So it's disappointing that she well, isn't on the set at all, but I mean, you get a pretty good handful of like people interviewed, which I like, as well as the uh, production designer, who is Catherine Hardwick, who directed Bloody Twilight. And that's another interesting one where, you know, she was talking about how she did this and that, how they moved from this set to that set because of, like, legal restrictions, all this kind of stuff. So th there's enough that gives you some ideas as to how they made the film. It's never too in-depth, but it's enough that's like, oh, it's nice for 15 to 20 minutes of listening to each person talk about their experiences in the making of the film and reception it's gotten and, you know, cult status and stuff and whatever. So there's there's elements of that, but most of it's focused on the actual making of rather than post the fact. Um, so it's nice enough, you know. Um, the uh, Tank Girl Power, or Girl Power video essay by Alexandra Hill and Nicholas was really nice. Um, it doesn't talk a lot about Tank Girl, which is bizarre. It's like a eight, ten minute long video. Um, pretty standard length, realistically. It's nicely edited. I will give it that. Uh, Alexandra's nice. She's coherent. I can understand what she's saying. Her What she's talking about is really interesting, especially for someone like me who it doesn't... I'm not hugely aware of a lot of, like, 90s feminism, especially, like, you know, they're talking about, like, like the... Um, I was going to say Powerpuff Girls, the uh, Spice Girls and stuff like that. They, She dives a lot more into kind of the stepping stones that led from like early 90s feminism to where you get to with uh, Tank Girl. So it was interesting. There wasn't a lot diving into Tank Girl on that degree, which is maybe my criticism of it. It, it is my criticism. She talks about Tank Girl for like 30 seconds to a minute. But at the same time, as a history lesson to give you the context of how they got to here in terms of that... It's actually really nice. So it's like, I learned a lot by this video essay that I didn't know. And I was like, that's cool. Like, it's not exactly stuff I didn't want to learn. I'm like, hey, that's cool. I've never really put in the time and effort to actually learn about it. So, yeah, I don't know. It was, it was nice. It was, it was a nice retrospective on um, feminism of the time. So that's uh, really interesting. Um, and again, nicely edited, nicely written. Overall, a really fun video essay. Um, and, of course, you get the archival feature, which is basically just a VHS rip of you know, behind the scenes, them talking to the camera, this and that. It's five minutes long. It's not bad. There's some stuff. There's some interviews with Stan Winston in there. So there's still some interesting stuff that wasn't talked about in any other of the videos. Um, but yeah, so I imagine the commentary track would pick up a lot of stuff as well. So yeah, that's that's the gist. That is Tank Girl. Um, as an overall, pretty fun. Uh, it's not everyone's cup of tea, even looking at the people who I am friends with on uh, Letterboxd or the people I follow on Letterboxd and their reviews of it. And I'm like, man, a lot of people just do not like this film flat out. Um, and I can understand that it's not for everyone. I can understand it being a cult film. Like, this is a cult film. This isn't one of those, it's, it's Fight Club, it's a cult film. It's like, no, no, this is a film that bombed and that nobody liked and that those who do like it are the reason why this set exists, much like Super Mario Bros. from 1992. Like, you know... Those are cult films. This is a cult film. It's an underground cult bloody comic book adapted into a Hollywood picture, and it's weird, to say the least. But I thought it was fun. Uh, I'd like to revisit it. It's, again, the production design and the costuming and Laurie Petty really save it. Uh, this script is a bit too messy, realistically. Like, again, this, the story and everything is a bit too much. It's a bit too crazy. Um, but, again, you sometimes just you just kind of you go with it, you know, if you can't continue with the journey as it goes and just get lost with it, then you will just fall off and just be like, this kind of sucks. So, um, yeah, it's very energetic. So I appreciate that. Anyway, let me know your thoughts down below. Um, I'll hopefully get around to reading some of those uh, essays as well, especially John's, but uh, Jarrett's as well and so forth. So, yeah, I don't know, it's a cute little book. I like it. It's a nice set. I'm very happy I got it. It did take an extra week to get here. Um, but it came, like, I got it, like, the day after it was released as a limited edition set, which is quite cool, so, because the standard release came out, like, a week prior, uh, which is fine. It is what it is. It's been shipped, it's delivered, and I appreciate it, so, yeah, awesome. Well, um, you can go check it out. I think it's still on their website. Uh, I'll link it down below, and, uh, if not, just get the standard edition. Um, and that's all. Thanks for watching. See you guys next time. Adios.